I'll go ahead and introduce John. So John brings a lifetime of passion for wolf recovery to the Rockies and Plains as he works to restore wolves to the region. By working with stakeholders across the spectrum, he works to create a strong coalition of support, ensuring that wolves and people can coexist in the West. John has several years of experience in wolf education, advocacy, and husbandry, having previously led the education and outreach department at the California Wolf Center. In addition to a strong background in wolf advocacy, John's experience in wildlife rehabilitation and restoration comes from having spent nearly a year living in Belize with injured and orphaned primates and working with local communities to promote their reintroduction and protection. He also has some really awesome stories about manatees. These experiences have provided him with a strong background in forging the partnerships necessary for successful wildlife restoration and a commitment to hear the howl of the wolf in the Rockies again. John, I'll go ahead and give it over to you and let you share your screen. Awesome. Thanks, Rosie, and, and thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us here today. Apologies for the, the chaos of my beautiful Zoom background as I... I continue a move. Um, and I will just remind us all that we uh, we had plenty of technical difficulties before the Zoom from a home environment. Uh, this this certainly was my experience with, with presentations anyway. Um, anyway, as I was saying, thank you all for joining us. Uh, before I get started and jump right into some things about Colorado, um, and I will, I'll do my best to be brief. It's always a challenge for me. Um, I do want to take a moment just to do an acknowledgement. Uh, I, I think we've heard several points throughout the day, but um, you know, speakers earlier reflecting on the Anishabe values, I think really highlights that there's a, a great similarity to what's happened to the persecution of our wildlife and the indigenous people who share this land. Um, and I want to recognize as we talk today about wolf recovery efforts, wolf reintroduction efforts, and the parallels that that has to a lot of our social justice issues. Um, in particular, as I am making this presentation on behalf of Colorado and from Colorado, I want to particularly recognize uh, the, the uh, indigenous sovereignty uh, and peoples who once shared the land of Colorado. There's not a part of the West uh, in wilderness that we can find that was not first touched and explored by those indigenous peoples who preceded us, particularly here in Colorado, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute peoples. Um, so just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge that before jumping in to our presentation right here. All right. So uh, as Rosie said, I'm John Murtime I'm with Defenders of Wildlife. My contact information right up there, that email address is the uh, probably the best way to get a hold of me. So I certainly John, encourage everybody. Yes. I'm not seeing your screen. Oh, uh, probably don't want that screen. Let's try a different one. Okay. Is that still not giving it to you? There we go. Perfect. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, Rosie. So there it is. There's the email address. <laughs> what are we going to do today? I'm going to take us briefly uh, through a little bit of the history of wolves in Colorado and then just talk a little bit about what's going on right now. I do want to try to leave open some time for questions, so I may fly through some of the later slides. Um, feel free to start getting questions in at any time. That is really how I like to kind of handle these things. Uh, but you've heard from several of us today at Defenders Wildlife with earlier presentations by Zoe and Tristy. And just a quick mention here, our work is uh, nationally focused. It's really about imperiled wildlife species. That is the main thrust, particularly here in North America. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. That is on the ground field work. That can be advocacy. We do a lot of work in DC and at uh, state houses throughout the country. Um, and as well, a lot of uh, direct activism and really making sure that our voices are heard. Let's do a quick recap. So everybody's up to speed on the Colorado situation. So as you uh, hopefully have heard by now, in November, 2020, Proposition 114 passed in Colorado. Prop 114 was a bill that quite simply asked Coloradans if they wanted to reintroduce wolves. Unfortunately, um, that bill did pass, and so it is now uh, a law in the state of Colorado that gray wolves must be reintroduced by the end of 2023. And in January, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission adopted a timeline and a process for what that reintroduction will look like. I'll quickly 
caveat here, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission is actually the group that's going to be in charge of creating this plan and putting it together. Um, that is based on the language of Proposition 114. So that's a wildlife commission like uh, most states have, uh, in this case, naturally, uh, particular to Colorado. Uh, a few months ago, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Center and the commission hired a third party facilitator to see over the engagement process, uh, including public engagement and two groups that were put together, the stakeholder advisory group, which is a group comprised of uh, citizens of Colorado who represent different interests and the technical work group which is uh, more experienced experts in wolf reintroduction and management. So these include uh, wolf biologists and state agents who have experience, direct experience with wolves. So now let's go backwards a little bit. Let's talk about the history of wolves in Colorado. Um, of course, have we, as we heard earlier today, there used to be somewhere in the ballpark of 2 million wolves here in North America. But in the uh, late uh, 1800s, early 19th century, Colorado joined a number of other states in issuing their first bounty on wolves. And this was a very popular means throughout the West, really uh, an attempt to eliminate large carnivores to transform the way that uh, agriculture was performed on a large scale. And that was a highly effective program, as we likely all know, against wolves. As a result, by 1943, we believe, is the date that the last wolf in Colorado was killed. So come the 1980s, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services actually starts looking all throughout the Northern Rockies to talk about what a wolf reintroduction will look like. Now, this is following, of course, on the heels of the Endangered Species Act and a lot of other actions um, that took place in the 70s that started the momentum. By the mid 90s, of course, we had a famous reintroduction of gray wolves in the northern Rockies. At that same time, though, Colorado had been under consideration, but a couple of actions had dissuaded uh, the federal government from participation in Colorado, particularly that then CDAO, formerly used to be the Colorado Department of Wildlife, had uh, declined to voluntarily participate in a reintroduction on three separate occasions, two before the release dates of uh, Yellowstone and Central Idaho. Despite this, all throughout this time, Coloradans had made clear their interest in wolves. Um, again, we hear this all throughout the North, Northwest. What we see the governments doing, what we see these commissions doing is not reflective of the values of the populace. And that's a lot of what went behind the decision to take this directly to the voters. We knew the science supported wolf recovery. We knew Coloradans supported wolf recovery. We went ahead and took advantage of provisions that allowed us to put this on the ballot. I'm using a royal here, by the way. Um, this was a coalition effort. This was by no means Defenders of Wildlife doing this alone. Um, very big effort, the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project, if, uh, if you want to learn more. But why, why Colorado? Uh, Colorado was a missing link. We had populations to the north and to the south, and this op uh, presents a really opportune moment to restore that connectivity. Um, this is also ideal wolf habitat, about 17 million acres in the western slope of the state. Uh, that's public land that is largely timbered forest land. It's ideal wolf habitat. And we have an excellent prey base of elk, around 280,000 elk in the state. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons why Colorado makes sense for wolves. And in fact, wolves have come to the state a couple times in the past though it's been very infrequent. And as you can see, just a quick little rundown here of a few of those, uh, these are the confirmed sightings of wolves over the past 15, 20 years or so. Um, nearly every one of those wolves that came to Colorado failed to find a mate, failed to have any puppies and ultimately died um, either in Colorado or lost to follow up. Um, now a little excitement on here in 2019, we had a wolf that came down from Yellowstone was confirmed up there in the north part of the state and actually earlier this year we confirmed that that wolf did find a mate and has had a litter of puppies and that's actually the first uh confirmed official litter of puppies born in colorado since sometime in the 1930s so that has been really exciting but we wanted to take it to a vote because as you can see if we depend only on wolves to come into the state on their own they simply were not arriving in the numbers that would be necessary to establish a self-sustaining population. Those arrivals were really rare and infrequent. 
Um, and here we are 25 years after the reintroduction and we've just had our first natural litter of puppies. So fortunately, uh, that, was, that was a win in November. So what happened? I won't read all this out loud, but Proposition 114 became state statute 33-2-105.8. It became a law here in the state of Colorado with a couple important things I'll point out. The deadline, December 31st, 2023, uh, reintroductions must use the best available science, take place on the Western Slope, must require a compensation program in the state for the rare loss of livestock, and this one is uh, particularly important right now. We specified that the wolf was a non-game species, meaning hunting and trapping provisions should not be considered. Now, who are the decision makers? It's a uh, board of 11 in Colorado. These are appointed by the governors and they are meant to represent certain different walks of life, uh, largely meant to represent ranching and the sports person's industry, but we are trying to change that. We are working on mixing things up a little bit. The uh, three gentlemen you see on the left side of your screen are our most recent appointees, including uh, a name that may be familiar to many of you, Jay Touchton, who is a, uh, an attorney um, who helped with a lot of the wolf cases throughout the 90s um, and early 2000s. And most recently, we've had appointed, though not yet confirmed, Dr. Karen Michelle Bailey uh, from UC Boulder. This is the timeline the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission adopted in January. You can see that it begins a education and listening tour that we're in the midst of right now. Um, and that's supposed to conclude sometime at the end of this month. They're, they're gonna conclude public comments at the end of this month, take September to process that. And hopefully around that time, we should get the results of a public opinion survey. The technical work group and stakeholder advisory groups have been put together. They are currently serving once a month and that's an ongoing process. Um, I will quickly offer that, of course, the biggest thing to be concerned with with this timeline is that it brings us right up to the deadline of December 2023. You may have heard some uh, opposition suggestions that we were trying to expedite the timeline of releases. That's not true. We're anticipating that there are going to be delays. Um, of course, we have one that's on all of our horizons. That's the federal delisting case um, in the in. Uh, the federal courts in California, which I, I believe will have our first hearing in November, um, that can throw a lot of uncertainty into this. Um, and so we're worried that if we wait until you know those first wolves get released in December 2023, if we have any kind of delay whatsoever, we're going against the legal language that the voters approved. A couple of things that have happened, though, uh, the state legislature jumped in and some good news here. Uh, we got some funding secured for this to make sure that we're going to do this in a good way. One really common thing we were hearing from the sports persons community in particular is they said, well, you know, the hunters and fishers are not the ones who want the wolves reintroduced, but they're the ones who are going to have to pay for it through their hunting and fishing licenses. So we said, okay, let's take that off the table then. HB 21-1243 was a bill that passed that said we won't use hunting and fishing dollars for the reintroduction of wolves but we will identify all these other sources that are available and in doing so secured about $800,000 for wolf reintroduction. Um, in addition, we had a, another cool bill passed, uh, Senate Bill 21-249. This actually is uh, not directly related to wolves, but it's kind of cool, so I'm gonna mention it anyway. Uh, normally to get a state wildlife park pass in Colorado, it's $80 a year, but this bill has now made it that when you go to register your vehicle, you can choose instead to pay $30 for the year to get that pass. It is actually an opt out provision. So to not pay that $30, you actually have to select against it. Um, it's expected that's going to actually raise a lot more revenue for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And that money specifically is to go to search and rescue efforts, park maintenance, and for the uh, state wildlife action plan species, which include the gray wolf. So some, some of that money may uh, come down to help our wolves out. Finally, out of the state's uh, annual budget, they approved an additional 1.1 from the general fund. Um, all that to say in the first year, at least, we're looking just shy of $2 million, which is well over what early estimates uh, put the first year at around three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000. So we're feeling very secure um, in that funding there. 
I had also mentioned a third party facilitator had been hired. That's the Keystone Policy Center out of Keystone, Colorado. Their job is largely to uh, keep keep an even hand on the uh, you know on the wheel, make sure that things are proceeding, that um, we're being productive. And again, just a quick mention: our technical work group. Um, you'll recognize some names on that group, like Doug Smith, Mike Jimenez, Carter Niemeyer. Um, again, these are a lot of wolf biologists and experts. Uh, and their their goal really is to tell Colorado Parks and Wildlife what to expect and how to do it. The stakeholder advisory group is more geared towards looking at some of the social implications, the social impacts, and again, dealing with anxieties that may exist about wolf, what wolves may or may not do, what their impacts may or may not be. In either case, though, both of these groups are purely advisory. They have no decision-making authority, though, of course, if they arrive at consensus, we expect that the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission will take their recommendation seriously. So what I'm going to try to fly through here a little bit, and, and uh, we are going to share in the handouts, I think, afterwards, I'll, I'll make sure with Rosie, um, some talking points and guidelines if you do want to get involved in some of this public input process here in Colorado. Um, but of course, why does public input matter? Uh, folks need to hear from us. We, we unfortunately do have some poor examples going on in the Northern Rockies where the public's been clear. I mean, in, in Wisconsin too, the public has been loud, they've been unified, they've been clear, and the governments don't listen. Um, and that can be very discouraging, uh, believe me. <laughs> but it's important that we don't stop because they're not the only ones watching and listening. Um, the press is watching. Other people are watching. This is still how we create that groundswell and how grass roots meets grass tops. Um, so we got to keep at this. When these public opportunities are there, uh, we have to make sure that our voices are being heard, even when we feel like we are being ignored. And in some cases, we might be. That record doesn't disappear. It's still a talking point today the million comments we got on the wolf delisting several years ago. So this stuff does matter. There are going to be 14 open houses. Actually, many of these have already ended. These started in July. They'll go through the end of this month, but 14 open houses across the state. This is not like your typical virtual house. With This is more like a science fair. You walk up, there are four booths. You can go booth to booth, ask questions, have conversations. But it's very different from the public engagement process. Most people probably anticipate it. Um, no registration required. They do ask you to check in, sign in, just so they can keep account of who's showing up. Um, I will also say they're not taking notes, for the most part, at these meetings. They are asking most people to contribute their thoughts to their online form. And that's where most people, I think, on this call can help us out. That online comment form, it does ask the question if you're a Colorado resident, but that's not a prerequisite to fill it out. So even if you don't live in the state of Colorado, they are still soliciting for your opinions. And that's where I think a lot of people here can help us. Um, another thing that has popped up, for those who are in the state of Colorado, a virtual town hall, which is expected to be more like the public shows up and gives a prepared testimony. Um, three minute cap is what they've set for that. Registration is required for this one. Um, this, I believe, is uh, requiring Colorado citizens for the virtual town hall. So if you do live in Colorado and you're interested and you don't have that link, you want to get registered or you want to know, hey, what, you know, I, I have some ideas what I want to talk about, but I could use some help. Please get in touch with us. Uh, absolutely would be happy to, to help work with you on any testimony you want to prepare. As always, though, just some general tips with this stuff. Please be respectful. Um, you know, the things that we say, we know that we are often under a microscope. People are looking for any excuse sometimes to paint wolf advocates as, you know, crazy environmentalists and, and eco terrorists. Uh, but that means we've always got to be mindful of that kind of stuff and make sure we counter that narrative um, with that kind of respectful and professional approach to things. So uh, make sure you're incorporating that and then personalize things. So again, we, I'm hoping to, to share a talking points document with you by email after this uh, conference with some additional information. Those are our talking points. That's, that's my voice. That's our language. Speak to your values. Find what in there strikes a chord with you, and that's what you should talk about. Um, I'll put it in your words because that's what makes it the most impactful. Also, it is by no means necessary to attend both 
online and in person. And in fact, I really would encourage online um, attending in person if it's convenient to you and you'd like to go, but I would not plan a long trip for it. I think you, you might be a little disappointed. All right, here's what the website is. Wolf Engagement co.org wolf engagement colorado.org and this is the home page right there click here to complete the summer 2021 comment form and away you go um, i'm just going to take us through the topics that they're asking on that comment form they are asking about engagement education and outreach i'm gonna fly through these wolf restoration so the actual act of, of recovering the wolves Wolf management, we all know what that word is the euphemism for. And livestock interaction. So of course, that uh, conservation, uh, sorry, coexistence approach and everything we do there. Now, what I wanna say about these four topics, these are four very broad topics. Each one of them, when you go on that online form, they actually have sub, point, sub points, sub bullets under each of these topics. And they are asking some pretty specific questions, I think, um, that a lot of the public might just not really be all that familiar with. Um, so this is a good opportunity for many of us as you know, wolf experts, people who are very knowledgeable, very engaged to kind of help filter that material a little bit. Um, that's the idea behind the talking points document that we put together. But if you are looking to direct some of your own you know, member supporters or friends and, and allies um, to get engaged, Take, take some time and look through the things they're asking here because they do get fairly specific. Um, but having said that, again, I wanted to make sure I had ample time for, for some Q&A. So I'm going to get off the formal presentation there and kick it over to, to Rosie to help facilitate. There are a lot of questions, John, so we will we'll go through here. So I think that you answered this question, but is there value in non coloradan submitting public input? And will they be weighed as, as heavily as Coloradans? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think there's value, but uh, practically speaking, they likely will be weighed. I, I think anything you can do if you are making a public comment uh, and you're not a resident of Colorado to mention that you recreate in Colorado, you know, that you come out here, or you have family out here, but make some type of connection to the state if you can. If you can't, that's okay. Um, you know, it's, it's just, I think it may impact the way that that information is received. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, it sounds like Colorado is doing things differently with social tolerance education than the states where wolves migrated in on their own. Do you see Colorado as a model of what recovery could look like with large social support? I think it has that potential. Okay. Um, you know, we have to see what happens, but I mean, we have been saying this whole time, Colorado is in a unique position. Um, to rely on 25 years worth of solid data and experiences. Um, there's no better studied terrestrial mammal than the wolf. And we have so much experience to draw on right now. Um, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be the new standard, but we also know there are a lot of forces at play and this stuff gets political and, you know, things don't always work out quite the way that we hope, but, you know, we're going to fight for that and we're going to fight that social tolerance at the front of this that people recognize because it was a popular vote the coloradans did ask for this you know there's some debate to say well regionally the vote was skewed along you know popular partisan lines but um this is different from the northern rockies where maybe the federal government came and dropped those wolves off and they felt like it was done to them we voted for this in Colorado. So I think that makes a big difference. Along those lines, do you see Colorado Parks and Wildlife respecting and adhering to what the public wants? To a point, um, you know, we always need to really keep you know, our governments uh, under the microscope uh, and, and make sure that they are reflecting our values. I mean, they're public employees, so they should reflect the public value. Um, having said that, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the commission have stated very clearly many times that they have no interest in relitigating the election. They understand that this is the law of the land and they're going to see it done. Um, you know, exactly what that looks like on a person to person basis within the agency. Yeah, you'll probably get some variety. 
Awesome. Thank you. A couple questions here, a couple part question. Um, with the introduction of Wilson Colorado, what types of public education and outreach are being done? Um, how are you, one, planning to educate state and federal employees on the identification of these animals? I smile because I, I know I know the spiel. And two, planning to educate the general public while easing any fears they may have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is really important. Unfortunately, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has done a pretty good job of reaching out to Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, you know, even the northwestern states of Oregon and Washington to get some of this experience and, and to get a better understanding of how to do this, how to identify what they should be prepared for. As part of that, there was an education series that they did. They did three different topics. Um, had a number of experts come out. These were webinars. They're on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, website. If you'd like to, to still go out and watch them, they're on their YouTube as well. Um, so those were recorded and available for the public. Um, and those covered a lot of kind of the, the big topics that everybody's wondering about. Um, but in addition to that, we're doing a lot of work directly with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to try to prepare them for a lot of the coexistence tools to try to explore what does the state need? Do we need to look at any legislation, for example, to expand uh, options or funds, a coexistence fund? Um, and a lot of kind of work that's happening between NGOs like Defenders, um, CPW government, as well as uh, Colorado State University, which has the Human Carnivore Center for Coexistence. So they've been really engaged in this as well. So a lot of ways that we're trying to get the information out there, um, a lot directly to the agency. We're also, as always, doing presentations, webinars with the general public. And of course, we also participate in workshops and direct training opportunities with ranchers. Um, you know, so we want to make sure these coexistence tools, but also the techniques, the training, the evaluation, um, all those sort of things we're trying to participate in, really to make sure that wolves are healthy, our livestock herds are healthy, our wildlife are healthy. That's where we all agree. Um, whether you, no matter what part of the state you live in or, or what else you believe in, we kind of all want to see that. So John, you talked about the significance of Colorado and um, the, the linking between uh, the Mexican gray wolves and the Northern Rocky wolves. Is there any possibility of a um, Mexican gray wolf, gray wolf hybrid coming up here? Is it possible that we'll have more Mexican gray wolves? Has there been a specify that it is the gray wolf instead of the Mexican gray wolf that will be reintroduced? Yeah, it's a great question. This is a big topic um, that, that a lot of people have been wondering about. Of course, I will say it wouldn't be hybridization because they are the same species, um, but I certainly get the meaning. W would Colorado one day be a place of genetic integration between, say, Canis lupus occidentalis and Canis lupus bailii? I think that's historically true. You know, I think historically Colorado was active genetic radiation um, between gray wolf subspecies. But as we probably all appreciate the, the gray wolf subspecies argument, gets really wild and crazy. Um, it's interesting because for the purposes of the Mexican gray wolf, there's a legal argument that was made that depended on their subspecies status to give them that specific protection in that area where, where that population is. But biologically, they're gray wolves. And that subspecies distinction doesn't make a ton of difference. Um, now, because of that legal distinction, Mexican gray wolves are banned from leaving New Mexico or Arizona. Effectively, if they cross uh, Highway Interstate 40, they go north of I-40, they will get captured and brought back. Um, that's based on their 10J designation, actually. Um, do I still have my, my screen up, actually? We do. I yeah. have, uh, 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 maybe I got rid of it. Okay, well, you can watch that cool wolf run. <laughs> the 10J designation, in the Mexican gray wolf population, put that geographic barrier around them. That is currently under review. We are hoping that that 10J will be expanded all the way to the Colorado, New Mexico state line, or even in Tanner State 70 in Colorado. Um, if that were to happen, we may one day see that natural kind of mix of gray wolves. However, based on everything I'm hearing, and it 
it's still unsettled, could go in any direction, but Colorado, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is not seriously considering a reintroduction of Mexican gray wolves in Colorado. It is likely that the wolves they will reintroduce will come from the Northern Rockies. Got it. Thank you, John. Um, one last question before you. Um, can you go ahead and explain the uh, classes that you're doing with ranchers and farmers all across Colorado, since we are in a very unique situation where the wolves, the majority of the wolves are not here yet. So uh, we can start building that, educate those foundations. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about those classes and those workshops? Sure, sure. Um, you know, and as far as specifics go, you know, this is not, uh, I don't want to make this seem like it's a defenders of wildlife, the only, you know, people who know how to do this or are doing this, or, because the truth is, we don't. It's the people who come and give these presentations and who give these classes who have the knowledge. Um, you know, oftentimes we work in a facilitation capacity to bring ranchers from other parts of the country and even Canada uh, to come out and share their experiences with local ranchers and producers. Um, and really to challenge that idea that this has to be done to you and that this is going to have a negative impact. Um, in many cases, they've been able to demonstrate even positive impacts by some of the behavioral changes they introduce into their herd management. Um, I don't want to oversell any of this. Of course, I'm not a rancher myself, so I can't speak directly to the value of these programs. I can only kind of share that anecdote that I, I observe. Um, but these have been very well received. Not at first. A lot of times people are hostile when these things begin, but after these workshops end, people are saying, well, okay, okay, maybe we can have a conversation. And you build on that. Um, you develop those relationships and you get those early adopters and you support those early adopters as much as you can so that you hope it starts to kind of trickle out and other people in that community start seeing it and start saying, okay, well, let me give it a try. Um, that's really how we change the way that this is done. I also, though, do think that a lot of the onus, see, a lot of the responsibility is on us in urban environments, too, um, because we are all very familiar with the big bad wolf myth, and we know it's a myth, we know how it's exaggerated, but I often say we're guilty of perpetuating the big bad rancher myth, um, and the reality is, you know, it's complex situation. There's a lot going on. People have a lot of reasons for why they may arrive at their values, but most ranchers I've interacted and spoken with, they, they do value their animals. It is difficult, I know, because they're going to go to slaughter, but I've, I've heard grown men, you know, in, in a fit of anxiety and tears because they can't find calves at night and they think the wolves are going to get them. Um, and so it's like, it, it does matter to them. And so I think we have a responsibility too. And this you know, it, not everybody eats meat, but for those who do, I think we all would prefer that that beef came from a grass fed, you know, holistically managed. Instead, I think we do end up purchasing, though, a lot of our beef from factory, you know, farming situation, factory ranching situations. And there's a disconnect there because we often think of those factory operations as being ranchers. And I'd say that's the farthest thing from the truth. You know, a, a rancher is usually a family, a small family operation. Obviously there's a broad spectrum on that, but I think just trying to take that approach of a little more compassion and understanding, even when our values do not align, even when we disagree on say everything, <laughs> we have to find a way to bridge the gap because the reality is there's, there's just too much of us on either side. If we just go after each other, it's the wolves that suffer. So, um, I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs> no, that's a really good reminder. It's a really good reminder that if you go head to head and no one budges, then um, then that's no way to reach a compromise and who ultimately suffers in that situation. It's the wildlife, right? Um, so yeah. thank you so much, John, for your presentation, for letting us know what's going on with Colorado wolves. As always, it's wonderful to hear you talk about Colorado wolves all the time. Um, and thank you so much for stepping in in light of some technical difficulties. You're a true MVP, and I appreciate you immensely. Um, and everyone on the call, I'll be, um, we'll look into getting the um, information that John was referencing, um, those talking points for how you can engage in some of these Colorado um in some of these Colorado conversations um, after, after the conference. So thank you all so much. And John, once again, thank you.